welcome to the Haddon Library's contribution to the 2020 University of Cambridge Alumni Festival. The Haddon Library was officially founded in 1936, but our myth of origin goes back 16 years further than that. It's told most famously in Alison Hingston Quiggin's biography of Alfred Haddon, Haddon the Headhunter. The story begins with the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology hosting the books of the Cambridge Antiquarian Society and of Baron Anatole von Hugel, the museum's founder. And they were there, but nobody knew the collection very well. And the Board of Anthropological Studies had appointed a committee to sort the problem of the library, but the committee never did anything and nobody else had time really. And Alfred Haddon, during a long vacation with his extended family and helpers, such as Ethel Fegan, gathered and classified and catalogued and shelved all these books in a lumber room, which was actually quite a large hall. And at the next meeting of the Board of Anthropological Studies, Haddon asked the Library Committee's rep to report what they'd done. And as he predicted, they hadn't done anything. So Haddon led the board to his makeshift library and they dissolved in roars of laughter and Haddon knew he had done well. And that was in 1920. So 2020 is the centenary of the Haddon Library's precursor and we're claiming it as ours as well. And today's speakers have made a special study of the life of Alfred Haddon. Anita Hurley is the Senior Curator for World Anthropology at today's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. It's next door to the Haddon Library. And she's worked much in the Torres Strait where Alfred Haddon did his most famous field work. And her book, Recording Custom, Alfred Court Haddon's Journals from his expedition to the Torres Strait, 1888-89 and 1898-99, that's co-authored with Jude Philp and it's due out in December. And after Anita's presentation, we'll see a video by Kieron Walsh. Some of you may remember the photo exhibition that Kieron brought to be the Haddon's contribution in the 2013 Alumni Festival. And since then, he's been awarded a PhD by Maynooth University for his research into Alfred Haddon's fieldwork on the west coast of Ireland. And he'll be telling us how forward looking Alfred Haddon was. And after that, there'll be a chance to ask questions of the speakers. Now, the first official Haddon librarian was Alfred Haddon's daughter, Kathleen Rishbeth. I believe we have her daughter, Margaret, and Prill Rishbeth, the widow of Haddon's grandson, in the audience today. Welcome. Anita, over to you. So good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Aidan for the invitation to speak at this event, marking the centenary of the Haddon Library. And I also want to thank the audience for coming. Today, I'm going to talk about the long-term project with Jude Philp at Sydney University to publish Alfred Haddon's journal from his 1888 and 1898 expeditions to the Torres Strait and New Guinea. Crucially, the process of publication involved consultation and collaboration with Torres Strait Islanders and the descendants from the communities where Haddon worked. Haddon is renowned by academics and Islanders for his groundbreaking work in the Torres Strait. A Cambridge trained natural scientist, Haddon's anthropological and water scientific interests developed during his 1888 field trip to study marine biology. So here we have a map of the Torres Strait, and this is um, Mare, one of the easternly islands near the Great Barrier Reef, which was one of Haddon's bases for his field work. Haddon worked closely with islanders who assisted him with collecting reef specimens and shore dredging. Over time, he became fascinated with their culture. He shared their concerns expressed by elders that their customary beliefs and practices were under threat. Determined to record information before it was too late, he returned as the leader of the 1898 Cambridge Anthropological Expedition to the Torres Strait. 
The goals and expertise of the seven expedition members reflected an extremely comprehensive vision of anthropology, incorporating the study of local customs and beliefs, physiology, experimental psychology, medicine, physical anthropology, linguistics, and art. The expedition is noted for the integration of fieldwork with scholarly analysis, the innovative use of photography and film, and William Rivers's development of the genealogical method. With the assistance of named islanders, the expedition's work generated an enormous corpus of information and materials, including indigenous drawings, hundreds of objects, including this elaborate turtle shell mask, over a thousand field photographs, as well as sound recordings, film, zoological, and plant specimens. The extensive data published in the three, six volumes of the expedition's reports between 1901 and 1935 remains foundational for researchers working in the region. They continue to be of great interest to lineal and cultural descendants, are a source of inspiration for Islander artists, and have been extensively cited in local affirmations of island custom and in native title claims. Over the last two decades, the University Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology has been involved in numerous collaborative projects with Islanders related to the extensive Haddon collections in Cambridge. And this is the opening of an exhibition we did to mark the centenary in 1998, where we have Henry Rishbeth, Haddon's grandson, with Terence Wap and Ron Day, the chairman of the islands of Mare and Mabiag, two of Haddon's main sites. Dozens of islanders have visited Cambridge to research their cultural heritage, including a Torres Strait Islander delegation in 2010, a cultural exchange with students from Thai Guy College who came to work with us for 10 days in 2013. And these are just a couple of the many, many visits that we have. While the museum has lent Torres Strait objects to Islander exhibitions in Australia and returned copies of all of Haddon's photographs to their islands of origin in 2011, access to Haddon's detailed journals are restricted to people who are able to visit the University Library in Cambridge. Haddon's journals were sent as a series of letters to his wife Fanny in Cambridge. They are, here they are in the manuscripts room, handwritten on loose sheets of paper kept in two large envelopes. The journals are beautifully illustrated with over 120 drawings and they offer a very intimate account of his observations and experiences. The journals reference his interests and work in marine biology, geology, and geography. But his writings focus on the lives of islanders and neighboring Papuan peoples at the end of the 19th century. So here's a dance of the Waitutu cap on Thursday Island and details of objects that he collected. While the journals demonstrate Haddon's preoccupation with recording aspects of past custom, they are replete with lively vignettes of contemporary Islander life. And I'm going to just read a very short um, edited description of Haddon going on a dugong hunt with the mamoose or chief of Mabiag Island. Here we are scuttling along the dirty green sea which betokens shallow coral waters, and at length arrive at a spot where dugong are plentiful. Over the bow and to port and starboard, they are seen rising up to breathe and diving down again. One sees their rounded back and lastly, their fan-shaped tails for an instant, and then all is gone. This is the hunter's opportunity, and the boat undergoes those gyrations which sober men do not indulge in as it dodges about in the helmsman's endeavors to approach the prey. When distant, the natives shout and chatter in a very lively manner and go through a pantomime of spearing the dugong. But when one is close by, a sudden hush falls upon the crew are in, who are in a state of highly strung suppressed excitement. The mamoose stands on the nose of the bowsprit, wop in hand, and with the other steadies himself by the rigging, for the boat is pitching and tossing considerably. 
All of a sudden, the mammoose springs into the water, wop in hand. The aim was good, and the velocity of the spring, in addition to the weight of the spearsman, has driven the dart well home, and it's finally embedded in the thick, dense skin of the dugong. The suppressed excitement of the spectators finds heat in a shout and in various manifestations of delight, for Torres Strait Islanders are a demonstrative people. They were amused at the attempt which I exhibited, and more than once I, adopt, I caught myself adopting their elating and whistling in addition to the ordinary British methods of expressing delight and surprise. The mamoose has regained his walk and has clambered up onto the boat and expresses his satisfaction by a grin which would do credit to the Cheshire cat in Alice Through the Looking Grass. He then draws a picture of the dugong, which I first saw pass from the present to the past tense, and takes and when back on Mobiag, takes a photograph of the mamoose with his dugong. The smaller one was given to Haddon to dissect, and he reported that the intestines were 108 feet in length. Haddon's journals are also an important record of the political and social changes in this dynamic and cosmopolitan region, with the activities of colonial agents, missionaries, and traders threaded through his personal narrative. The journals also detail Haddon's research goals, methodologies, and practices during a formative period for the discipline of anthropology. And this is a sketch of the anthropological lab set up in the old church house on Mobiag. We've got, um, this is inside that house. This is Namoa using the color wheel. Rivers um, with Waria um, testing with the Hawkins E. And recording the, um, and Charles Myers recording the Malu songs with Ulai singing into the phonograph while Gizu plays the sacred drum Wasako. Unlike most anthropological accounts, the journals reveal how and from whom Haddon obtained his information and the broader and social and political context of his research. Of particular importance is the interactions that developed with named islanders, many of whom became friends, and the relations of trust that developed over time. And I think this is a particularly reflexive um, combination of photographs with um, the ex five of the expedition members on Mobiag and then their four main assistants um, in exactly the same position as the expedition members. Here's Haddon having a picnic on the beach at Duar with Passy's family. And you can see Passy holding Haddon's shoulders and um, as, as a kind of this physical contact that often happens in the few photographs where you have Haddon and the Islanders together. Sorry, that's Sidney Ray, the linguist um, on the other side. Uh, uh, the expedition was welcomed by gifts of food on arrival at Mobiag and also on Mare. The photographic collections contain numerous family photographs which Haddon developed in the field and gave as gifts to his islander friends and assistants. And this is Nabua um, and his family on Mobiag. On the strength of his Torres Strait research, Haddon was appointed to the first position of ethnology at the University of Cambridge in 1900. And he and his expedition colleagues, William Rivers and Charles Seligman, were among the few who taught the first generation of professionally trained anthropologists in Britain. Plans to publish the journals were first discussed during a field trip to the region in 2016. We met with Islander representatives, including the direct descendants of the people who Haddon worked with on the four main island communities where his research was based. Gumagal on Mobiag, Miriam on Mare, Kukagal from Yama, and Aboriginal representatives for the Kurarag Nation on Muralag. PowerPoint presentations were prepared for each community, focusing on the material that came from their respective islands. While the presentations were generally well received and prompted much interest and discussion, overall people were initially cautious and needed more time and information in order to make decisions about publication. 
Over the next year, we worked on transcribing the journals and sent hard copies of relevant sections to families and community representatives. Following intermittent communications, by mid-2017, we received enthusiastic and unanimous approval from our Islander advisors to go ahead with the project. An underlying concern was the inclusion of racist language typical of the Victorian era, but Islanders agreed that we needed to include Haddon's full text to tell the story true. Islanders strongly supported our proposal to link Haddon's narrative with his, with his extensive collections held in Cambridge and various institutions in the UK, Ireland and Australia, and to provide details as to how these collections can be accessed. And indeed, we did bring all that material uh, together in, in the volume. Given patchy internet access and a limited number of personal computers, it was deemed essential to have a hard copy publication that could be readily distributed to communities. In October 2018, we went back to the Torres Strait to report on progress and publication plans. As in 2016, we conducted small group meetings with people from four Islander groups where Haddon based his research. We also gave presentations at larger community meetings. Discussions about Haddon's diaries were articulated within customary concerns. The interest in understanding more about the past in order to reinvigorate customary knowledges and practices today. The maintenance of cultural protocols in the distribution of knowledge and the ongoing negotiations within and between communities regarding rights to and ownership of knowledge, sea and land. We also gave formal presentations about the publication project to the board members of the Torres Strait Regional Authority who offered their support. Negotiations with Sydney University Press and the existence of the extraordinary rich visual material on offer led to an agreement to print full color, high quality copies of the book. The final publication now in press includes the full text of Haddon's expedition to the Torres Strait in New Guinea and all of the original journal drawings with 200 associated field photographs, indigenous drawings and images of some of the objects collected. The journals are contextualized with a substantial introductory essay and extensive footnotes to assist diverse readers with navigating the remarkable variety of people, places, and events. Islander colleagues, Ned David, chair of the Sea and Land Council, as well as the Torres Strait um, Educational Group, um, sorry, the Torres Strait Islander Regional Educational Council, and Lee, Leah Louis Chavez in the Department of History at the University of Sydney generously provided their perspectives in the foreword and the epilogue. Crucially, support from the Torres Strait Regional Authority, the University of Monash Indigenous Studies Centre, and the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, as well as the Haddon family has assisted with the costs of preparing the publication and most importantly, subsidizing over a hundred copies for three distribution. Unfortunately, plans to launch the book in Torres Strait in early 2021 are likely to be postponed due to COVID-19 travel restrictions. So we are making plans to launch it remotely and will arrange community presentations later when it is safe. The great news is that Torres Strait is, free, is COVID free, as is much of Northern Australia, and our Islander colleagues and friends are safe and well. Thank you very much. To begin, I thank Aidan for the opportunity to join Anita and John in this exploration of new facets of the life and work of Alfred Court Haddon. As Aidan mentioned, I attended the Alumni Festival in 2013, 
when I curated an exhibition of photographs from the Irish Ethnographic Survey, which hadn't established in 1891. The exhibition was hosted by the Haddon Library and in preparation for the opening, Aidan searched for Haddon's personal copy of the Ethnography of the Iron Islands, which the Royal Irish Academy published in 1893. Haddon didn't keep a copy, but Aidan found his file on the Iron Islands, which had become separated from the main body of his papers in 1913, 100 years before. This triggered a radical review of Haddon's ethnographic practice in Ireland, a major piece of doctoral research that has just been completed. For today, I will confine myself to one of the more remarkable facets of Haddon's career that emerged from this study, namely his development of a formerly innovative visual anthropology that he used as a vehicle for anti-colonial activism. The problem here is that this has remained invisible to a generation of historians whose work has been shaped by a determination to establish evolutionism as the dominant paradigm of Victorian anthropology. To illustrate this point, I challenge George W. Stocking's influential treatment of Haddon's 1891 critique of imperial policy with an alternative reading that is informed by the material that Aidan found in the library in 2013. So, let's look at this evolutionist programme and one of the main tropes it generated, namely that anthropology operated as a handmaiden of empire. We start in Ireland. Haddon's career in Ireland has been eclipsed by the 1898 expedition and as a consequence, the Irish component of the Haddon papers has been largely overlooked by historians of modern anthropology. The academic literature, heavily influenced by Stocking and Henry Kukuklik, has tended to a consensus that anthropology, as practised in Ireland in the 1890s, was uniformly evolutionary and colonial enterprise. This obscures the fact that Haddon's decision to become an anthropologist in 1889 galvanised a movement seeking a radical reconstruction of organised anthropology in the UK and Ireland. Haddon and his associates, James G. Fraser, William Henry Flower, James Tomate Chalmers, Patrick Geddes, Henry Havelock Ellis, Alice and Lawrence Gaum, Peter Kropotkin, Elise Reclou and his brother Eli, amongst others, attempted to synthesize anthropology, sociology, political economy, folklore and art into a unified field of post-evolutionist study with the object of achieving scientific social reform, a form of social anthropology that Radcliffe Brown would later claim as his innovation. Haddon was at the forefront of this movement. He was radicalised in the Pacific in 1888 and the West of Ireland in 1890. He attempted to publish a critique of imperial policy in 1891, but the editors of leading journalists rejected it before Thomas Henry Huxley suppressed it in January 1892 on the basis that it would be unacceptable to government. It is not difficult to see why Haddon opened his critique with a reference to the Indian and Colonial Exhibition of 1886, which showed the great gulf of tradition, language and religion that existed between British subjects and subject races in the colonies. Friction, Haddon continued, was inevitable, but the undisguised racism and ruthless exploitation of fellow subjects by colonists was difficult to comprehend for anyone who had not been to the colonies. Furthermore, colonists were supported by imperial forces, with the inevitable consequence that the British exterminated the inhabitants of the countries they annexed, whether by accident or design, fast or slow. Racism, Haddon argued, needed to be countered with sympathetic knowledge, an idea he borrowed from Peter Kropotkin, the anarchist geographer living in exile in London. This idea framed Haddon's proposal for the establishment of an Imperial Bureau of Ethnology. But the document registers a shift from outrage to pragmatism that is hardly surprising, given that Haddon asked Francis Galton, Alexander McAllister and Huxley to review it in the hope that they could get it published. Stocking discovered 
and transcribed Haddon's manuscript during research in British archives between 1969 and 1973. He published a typescript in the History of Anthropology newsletter in 1993. As an exposition of the historicist methods he employed in his study of Victorian anthropology. It was very effective. In eight, it was very effective. In 1989, James Urry described Stocking as the doyen of the anthropological past, and ten years later, Clifford Gertz described him as a writer who had an enormous impact on the way anthropologists see themselves and their profession. Joan Leopold, however, identified Stocking's determination to establish evolutionism as the dominant paradigm in Victorian anthropology as a problem. That determination is very evident in Stocking's treatment of Haddon's critique of imperial policy. In his paper in the newsletter, Stocking acknowledged the provocative tone and socialist attitude that Haddon adopted, but commented that it was not likely to win support for the discipline at the peak of the imperialist movement. But, Stocking concluded, in the future, appeals for the practical utility of anthropology were to be cast in language that an audience of imperialists might regard as less charged. Stocking did not refer to Haddon's socialist sympathies and provocative language in After Tyler, published two years later. Instead, Stocking represented the proposal as a way of enlightening imperial self-interest, an interpretation that was consistent with earlier scholarship by Kuklik and Uri. This body of scholarship has become codified in the handmaiden of empire trope, which acts as a convenient wrapper for evolutionary treatments of Haddon and his ethnographic practice. Stocking's transcript may be accurate, but his use of other material in the same file is more selective. He quotes Huxley's review of the document, but does not mention Huxley's reference to possible government censure, which confirms that Haddon's critique of imperial policy represented a meaningful and political challenge to the government of the day. Haddon deferred to Huxley, but he revived the text when Flinders Petrie asked him to take the lead in a debate on the impact of colonialism on other civilizations, a debate which took place in Ipswich in 1895. This event has the appearance of an insurgency breaking cover and the scientific establishment reacted accordingly. As Huxley predicted, Haddon was heavily criticised and he filed this clipping from a report in the Daily News. The correspondent wrote that Haddon had made some rather contemptuous remarks on the efforts of missionaries to induce naked races to clothe themselves, a sneer that probably drew from an audience of anthropologists loud applause. There were other articles like this, and it is clear that the imperialists in the press and organised anthropology regarded Haddon's language as both charged and utterly unacceptable. This contradicts Stocking's interpretation and undermines the validity of the handmaiden of empire trope. That in turn releases a cascade of alternative narratives, the most radical of which is Haddon's formal experimentation and anti-colonial activism. And this opens the way to a new history of Haddon's anthropology. Again, we begin in Ireland. In October 1890, Haddon included this slide in the visual ethnography of the Iron Islands, which he performed shortly after he spent a week documenting the geography and archaeology of the islands as a backdrop to a study of the people and the way of life. In 2014, I discovered the negative from which the slide was made in a decommissioned anatomy theatre in Trinity College, Dublin. The text of the slideshow is held in the file that Aidan discovered in 2013. This file also contains 10 pages of a journal that Haddon kept during his visit to the islands, which he extracted and pitched as an illustrated article to the editor of Lippincott's magazine in September 1890. One piece of information stands out. Haddon informed the reader of his journal that 
I can't tell you all the excursions we made in Arran. It would be as tedious for you to read as for me to write. Suffice it to say that Dixon and I left very little unseen and what with sketches and photographs, we have a great deal on paper. He promised a slideshow on his return to Dublin. The discoveries in the Haddon Library and Trinity College Dublin have made it possible to reconstruct the content, if not the circumstances, of that slideshow. A search of newspaper archives revealed that this was the first of several such slideshows, which I argue amount to a photoethnographic methodology that puts into practice a theory of instantaneous or social documentary photography that hadn't published in Notes and Queries in 1899. This methodology can be traced back to two slideshows that hadn't presented in 1890, shortly before he departed for the Iron Islands. Haddon wrote incidents in the life of a Torres Strait Islander for Lippincott's magazine in 1889. The magazine did not carry illustrated articles, so Haddon presented two slideshow versions in the Royal Dublin Society in February 1890. Newspaper reports highlighted the fact that Haddon illustrated the slideshows with many photographs taken in the Torres Strait and Papua New Guinea in 1888. These included shots of a reconstructed initiation ceremony and Haddon developed this theme 10 years later when he filmed the last dance of the Malazogote. The person who presided over initiation ceremonies on Mer Island. This stands as the first recorded use of a cinematographic camera by an ethnographer in the field. Emile de Brigard wrote a seminal essay on the history of ethnographic film in 1974. She represented Haddon's film as an example of salvage anthropology and as such irrelevant to the development of modern anthropology. I don't agree. Haddon was reading Kropotkin when he wrote Incidents in the Life of the Torres Strait Islanders and his statement that a key task of ethnography was to dispel atavistic prejudice against fellow subjects in the colonies was a direct translation of the anarchist call for geography in general education to be used to counter racism in the context of colonial expansion. Furthermore, Haddon was working with Havelock Ellis on a study of anthropology that would act as a manifesto for the reconstruction of anthropology as an instrument of scientific social reform. In this context, Haddon's short film can be interpreted as a transcultural exploration of the meaning of dance that was intended to transform the purpose and practice of anthropology. On that basis, I propose that the film was a singular modernist achievement and deserves a place in the anthropological canon, such as it is. To conclude, in this new history, Haddon's photoethnographic method becomes, in effect, a platform for anti-racism activism, one that has its analogue in the Tribal Voice project, an online campaign that provides a platform for Indigenous activists to campaign against land grabs, racial violence and genocide the very same issues that Haddon tried to bring into the public domain in his 1891 critique of imperial policy. 130 years on, Haddon's call for solidarity with the victims of colonialism was reiterated by Amazon activist Celia Zakriba in her short film that she posted on YouTube. I will finish with a short clip from this because I think it captures the spirit of Haddon's critique of colonialism especially his impassioned appeal to fellow anthropologists in Ipswich in 1895. That event alone shows how progressive humanitarianism rather than evolutionism shaped his vision of anthropology. Conseguiu nos matar na época da colonização. Também não conseguiu nos enterrar na época da ditadura. Mas atualmente nós vivemos um momento do genocídio legislado. É pela 
caneta que está nos matando. Quando o atual governo autoriza a flexibilização do armamento nos territórios indígenas, está autorizando executar os nossos corpos. E nós, povos indígenas, nós morremos não apenas quando executam a liderança. Nós, povos indígenas, nós morremos coletivamente quando nos nega o território. E as pessoas têm falado na sociedade brasileira, vocês não têm medo em tempo de acentuação da violência? E nós temos dito que nós temos medo mesmo. Thank you very much, Kieran and Anita. It's good to know that we've got a founder we can be proud of. And um, there are questions, there are questions. Um, very interested to hear, it's a question for both of you. Anita, it was very interesting to hear what you were saying about how Haddon is regarded by the, by the descendants of, of the people he worked with. Um, but you talk of some of the objects he, he took away from the island. Have there be, been any appeals for, for restitution of those to the Torres Strait Islands that, that you know of? We haven't had any specific claims for restitution of artifacts. There has been a claim, and there's an ongoing claim and concerns about human remains that are in the Duckworth collection. And that is something that is being negotiated. Um, I think it will be interesting to see what happens in the future. We have lent material from Cambridge to Australia and indeed lent material to shows that were curated by Islanders and that travel throughout Australia without um, asking for our usual protocols of having a curator or someone be there to do it. Um, and we've done what we can to be able to share information that we have. So, as I said, we have had dozens of Islander visits uh, to Cambridge. We've had a lot of people working with collections in the archives. We've had performances in the museum, both public performances and private performances that were done um, for spiritual reasons by Islanders for themselves. So we've tried to um, sort of not have a proprietorial kind of curatorship at, at the museum. Mm -hmm. I, well. I'm wondering if I could just add something just based on what Kieran's presentation, which I thought was amazing and just wonderful to think about what happened between his 1888 and 1898 expedition to the Torres Strait. And the kinds of, I've always thought that how you can see changes in Haddon's attitudes throughout, um, during, over time, throughout the journals. And I've always attributed much of that to his, to the personal relationships that he developed with people in the field. You know, where he goes from, you know, these aren't just islanders, they're named friends. They're, he calls them my friend, he calls people by name. He's concerned about their families. And I think that links in a very interesting way to think about the kind of work that he was doing in between those, stay, those two trips. And certainly the humanitarianism of Haddon's um, approach to his islander colleagues and friends comes through very, very strongly indeed. Do you want There's me to respond to, to that? Say, but I'll, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the changes between 1888, like in 1888, Haddon was working for Flower in the Ethnographic Museum and his relationship with Tomate Chalmers was James Tomate Chalmers was incredibly important because Chalmers was a nativist who believed in a Papua for the Papua New Guineans, for the Papuans themselves, as, as stated in, in a letter. And um, by 1898, although that continues as a very strong theme, Haddon, because of his home rule sympathies, has more or less been removed from an active career in marine biology in Ireland, 
as a government scientist, as Huxley warned. And he's trying to establish himself within Cambridge. So the, the setup of the Cambridge expedition is influenced by his attempt to establish himself within academic anthropology. And one of the key consequences of his speech in Ipswich in 1895 was that <coughs> the, the Section H, the British Association and Cambridge moved to block his employment as an anthropologist in Cambridge. But that's, that's a whole other story. So I think that I, I would see that as the, the big change is that you have this tension in his work between his humanitarianism and the essential conservatism of organised anthropology in the UK and Ireland. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Kieran, how is Haddon thought of by the descendants of his 1890s contacts? In, on, how, how is he thought of on the west coast of Ireland? Yeah, and, and after the exhibition in 2013 was the culmination of a tour of that exhibition up, to the, up along the west coast. And they were fascinated by him. And it has become an enormous resource for people. Like emigration was a, a, a fact of issue that hadn't acknowledged in all his reports. And his photographs have become, an enor like in the Torres Strait, have become an, an enormous resource for people who were looking for photographs of their great grandparents. The key question that comes up all along was, was he racist? And that, that, that's, so how is he regarded now? Um, that's a changing picture, Aidan, as this research gets into the public domain, there's been quite a good response to it. And um, that's changing the attitude to Haddon daily. And as I said, that's far from finished as a process. So he's moving from the evolutionist colonial anthropologist to a human rights activist. Right. Thank you. I need to a question, I think, for you. Yes. Are the journals available in digital format? Um, no, they're not. Um, the, the six volumes of the reports are widely accessible. Those are the published books, both in libraries and online. Um, the journals themselves aren't, and, not, and they won't be for a little while, but there are plans. I think the UL would like to, the University Library at some stage, would like to put them up as part of the Cambridge Digital Library project. I have to say that during my consultation with Islanders, they were initially very reluctant about some of the material going online, but also we needed to do a publication. Even though the Torres Strait is Australia and there are primary schools on these little islands, most very few people have computers. And I can testify at the unreliability of the internet, which the last time I was there was still an old dial-up system that crashed every couple of minutes. So internet, people have phones and communicating with people via mobile phones is, is very common, but not via computer. So what we needed to do, and this was one of my um, discussions, and, and I think a success with my negotiations with Sydney University Press, was to encourage them to publish a proper book with four color scanning all the way through and very good um, high quality illustrations because the visual material is so rich and now, of course, a lot of publishers with academic books, they only publish a relatively small number of books, and the rest of them are done as ebooks, which in this case wasn't really what we wanted. So our negotiations to be able to um, get very high quality books um, came with the provision that for at least the first couple of years that the material would only be available in that form. And of course, what the book does is something quite different than just the journals, because it brings together um, field photographs, the indigenous drawings, other drawings, and lots of other uh, visual information there, which a straight e, a straight online publication of just the journals, of course, wouldn't have. So we're sort of in between the, mm. the two different situation yeah. right now yeah right there's one here um 
and this again is for both of you. Thank you so much for a thought-provoking session. This one is from Hilary Ray. Thank you so much for a thought-provoking session. Do you think the strands of Haddon's approach and work have informed our interrogation today of museums, collections, symbolic use of statues, and treatment of indigenous artifacts? Haddon seems very modern all of a sudden very interested in his role in forming the discipline and, influ and influence on establishment of museums and a methodology of collecting objects. So, yeah. Ooh, that's a very broad question from Hillary, right? Yeah. Um, I, I guess sort of starting from the beginning, Haddon, has, Haddon is extremely well known in the Torres Strait. He's extremely, he's quite well known throughout Australia. So almost everybody knows who Haddon is. And certainly the influence of his work is something that, island, that Islanders are very aware of. And it's not just the influence of his work on what they think about museums and of objects, but that combination of how the materials that he recorded had had a real practical political implications and far-reaching implications for Islanders and indeed for all of Indigenous Australia. And I think this is something that really chimes with the last part of um, Karen's talk when he was showing the Indigenous activists from the Amazon. Because here you've got a situation where it was information from the expedition reports which overturned, which was used by Murray Island men from Mayor plaintiffs in the Queensland courtroom, which overturned the idea of terra nullius in Australia and made it, it asserted that a man named Eddie Mabo, and it's common, often called the Mabo case after one of the plaintiffs, um, Eddie Mabo who had land on Mare, um, that his rights, that the family rights to that land were retained. The effects of the so-called Mabo case on Australian politics have been massive since 1994. And it's, I mean, as I said, it overturned Terra Nullius and opened the door for land claim cases, not just in the Torres Strait, but throughout Australia. So it's had a really, really powerful um, political effect. The extent to which, going back to the question, it has been, I think, for a number of academic scholars, they would see Haddon's work as being influential on ideas of museums and material culture. But I wouldn't say that he was quite, it'd be interesting to hear what Karen has to say. I wouldn't think that I was quite so influential um, in the contemporary UK situation. Yeah. Karen? I don't know. Yeah, well, I'll go back to the earlier question by Michael is why, why this aspect of Haddon hasn't been taught because that is a huge question. And I think one of the things that I struggled with all along um, during my research was the academic culture and the way knowledge is accumulated over generations, especially if the initial search of the archives in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s was actually based on a false premise. It may have been a, a premise that was particularly popular at the time, which was anti-colonial and culturally critical. But as Joan Leopold said, and she called stocking on it in, in 1989, his methodology was shoddy. He made mistakes and he misquoted documents and that's very obvious in other areas so why hasn't it been taught i think you know that i think the foundational texts of the modern history of anthropology set have set the trend for over 30 years and that is changing now and i think as the um as hillary mentioned the, the black lives movement and the rethinking of colonial era museums i think that's going to change we're going to start looking more at Haddon's role as, an, as a humanitarian activist in more detail. And that would become much more part of the syllabus of the, of the history of anthropology. Um, his influence, I, just looking at Elaine's um, question there, his influence on collections and things like that. Um, when Haddon 
When Hatton resigned from his position in Cambridge, he left a collection of 10,000 photographic images to the museum. And in 1975, Margaret Mead wrote a, a, a very important essay called A Discipline of Words, where she castigated um, previous, a previous generation of anthropologists for having ignored the importance of photography and filmmaking in the collection of information of what you call the, the daily behaviours that were disappearing as globalisation progressed and differences were er eradicated, uh, were erased between people and populations. Um, so I think Haddon, I see Haddon not as a zoologist, and this is answering Elaine's question to some extent. His mother was an artist, and I think to look at what Haddon was doing in his, in his journals, as Anita mentioned, his illustrations, it comes across very strongly that Haddon was primarily an artist and a photographer, um, rather than a zoologist. And um, to finish very briefly, his legacy, in terms of collecting is the mounted card collection in the museum and the collection of photographic negatives in the museum as well and, and lantern teaching slides. Um, and that has been overlooked largely by historians of anthropology. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got five minutes left and we're not to overrun. <laughs> so thanks everyone for your questions and thanks Anita and Kieran for your presentations mm -hmm. and for giving us um, your answers as well. What, I'll ask you both this, what would you like us to take away from this afternoon? Anita first. Oh, right. Thank you, Hayden. Well, I think one of the things I'd like people to think about is just the value, and it goes a bit <coughs> to what I just said, is the value of the extensive archives, photographs, and collections that are housed in university libraries and museums. I think at the end of the 19th century, you know, anthropology was this ambitious new discipline and it was linked to colonial expansion, but it was the field workers were gathering enormous amounts of data, which we have housed in museums and archives. And it's just these, this project with the Torres Strait journals has just demonstrated the um, far reaching value of these collections. Um, and it's given it remarkable salience, as I said, changing attitudes as Kieran is through um, what we think about the history of anthropology. And I think the other thing that comes through is the importance of working with communities, of actually seeing, and I mean, as Haddon advocated, field work on the ground is really important and having a less proprietorial under, um, attitude towards these collections. I think I'll start to give Kieran needs a, t a chance. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd, I'd second all of that. Um, as I said, my work started when you went down to the locked room, Aiden, and found a file that no one knew existed up to that stage. Even Quiggan didn't have access to it. But I suppose, what do we take away from today? Um, anthropology was founded within, or ethnology, as it was called at the time, was founded within the anti-slavery movement of the 1830s hadn't revived that in the 1890s. It's back again on the agenda of the Black Lives Movement and the Amazon activists in the 2020s. And I think that's where we need to make up for the deficit in the teaching of anthropology, as identified by Michael earlier on. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you both, Kieran and Anita. It's been very, very stimulating. Thanks to everyone who's come along to the event or who's, who's watched it from, from your homes um, and contributed questions and um, contributed your interest, which is great. And as I say, it, it's good to know that we can take such pride in the man who founded the Haddon Library, which you see behind me in its, in its new, in, in its current location rather larger than the lumber room that Haddon used um, back in 1920, um, rather more posh. It's been two other libraries in its time, and it's now the Haddon Library and is likely to continue that way um, for the foreseeable future. So once again, thanks all round. Keep safe and well, everyone, and um, thank you.